Imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were. But without it, we go nowhere. Over the last hundred thousand years or so, humans have evolved their curiosity to explore their surroundings, their desire to take the chance of crossing that mountain pass, that raging river, that empty and desolate vacuum. And really, it is all a matter of perspective. What was once unknown becomes known, and perhaps even a standard for ourselves and others to achieve or surpass. But if it is all about the perspective, how does that idea change? Or better yet, change us over time? As with any career choice, explorers start out with some mild trepidation over the vagueness of their goals and cautious excitement concerning those first impending steps away from the civilization that cradled them. In the early years of the frameshift drive, or FSD, the idea of getting away from the pressures of civilization likely drove many to just choose a direction and go. With jump ranges much less than today's, making the commitment to get out of Dodge was not an easy one, nor trivial in its execution. The first person to ever explore anything didn't suddenly come to the epiphany. I am going to be an explorer now, and then walk out of their cave naked and weaponless in some random direction without any further preparation. And if they did, we can confidently assume that those genes are no longer with us in 3304. There's always a bit of planning first. They would ask themselves questions like, what shall I take with me on my trip? Equipment? Food, fuel, white socks, or blue? Those same questions apply to the blackness of space, though perhaps with a bit more rigour involved. In truth, every ship with an FSD currently sold is capable of becoming a decent exploration vessel, especially with all the recent advances in jump range. Synthesised FSD boosts, engineering, Guardian technology and the ability to use neutron overcharging to quadruple the normal range have already enhanced our drives far beyond what we previously thought possible, but it wasn't always that way. Just a few short years ago, the jump ranges for unengineered exploration-focused loadouts ranged from the Sidewinder at 21 light-years to the Anaconda at nearly 42 light-years. The Fer de Lance, maxing at 20 light-years, wasn't even considered viable for deep space back then. But today, with a little engineering and a Guardian FSD booster, a Ferdy can reach more than 40 light-years. Add some jumponium or a scoop of neutron juice, and that can easily increase to nearly 170 light-years. The basic outfitting of any exploration ship really only requires two things, a fuel scoop and a Class A FSD. Adding modules allows the journey to be more than just a Sunday drive, but may also decrease the maximum jump range. Ship-launched fighter bays for larger ships and surface recon vehicle or SRV bays for surface excursions both help to broaden the discovery envelope and also offer a change of perspective. For those who need or want to use the Neutron Highway, an Auto Field Maintenance Unit or AFMU is a must, but only because that path guarantees FSD degradation. The rest is really up to the individual. There is a process which most explorers go through once they step outside familiar space. First is the desire to show off everything interesting that they found on their journey. Pictures, videos and blogs start flowing from the traveller's subspace feed as they encounter a multitude of new stars, nebulae and habitable worlds along their path. Some are rushed and mediocre, while others are very good indeed. Whatever the quality, this is one of the most universal stages of space travel, and gives everyone else out there a familiar insight into a similar but different perspective. 
New capabilities in our system survey technology offer other ways to be the first, such as mapping the rings and surfaces of these rare finds. This one advancement now allows us to quickly find all the many planetary and spatial anomalies from orbit instead of spending endless hours flying inverted over the surface while performing exhaustive visual inspections. Now, within our sensor's view are the ancient ruins of extinguished civilizations and perhaps even those more recently inhabited. The eternal recurring question of where to next, once answered by a simple push of a button to initiate that next hyperspace jump is changing to should I stay or should I go? I think the majority of explorers are lone wolves at heart. Knowing that there might not be another human for thousands of light years is something I'm very comfortable with. At some stage in their personal narrative, every explorer eventually has an epiphany of some sort. This is commonly the dawning realization that, to paraphrase, space is big. I mean, really, really gigantically, mind bogglingly, humongously large. And we, by comparison, are not. This revelation manifests itself in a number of interesting and contradictory ways. Some react with ennui, whilst others acquire a sense of urgency. There are those who believe that somehow streamlining the process enough will enable them to see the whole universe before they die, almost as if the extraordinary effort to somehow make it back to civilization quickly to register their claims will result in some special form of virtual immortality, dead but remembered. During the early days of FSD travel, depending on the individual tolerance for and distance from home, this could compound an already unstable situation. Today, in most cases, a trip back to the bubble quickly relieves the symptoms. However, for those whose goal is still further out into the black, it can lead to even greater, sometimes fatal, psychological pressures if not dealt with properly. As telepresence has expanded beyond the corporate boardroom and onto our multi-crewed ships, lonely pilots can now receive visitors and companions when they most need emotional support. There are also therapists who make long-distance ship calls to help remind those longing for home that this too shall pass. An entire book could be devoted to space madness and still only scratch the surface of the nearly infinite ways we can all go a bit loopy. Increases in jump ranges, event organised meetups, and the moderating event of telepresence have all been seen to significantly reduce the number of reported fatalities and lost ships associated with this condition, but on their own, they cannot completely prevent it from happening. As another part of the process, this phase tends to see the individual display one or more of the following symptoms. Greed, boredom, fatigue, feelings of euphoria, invincibility and or hopelessness, among others. As with all repetitive actions over a long period of time, we tend to get very proficient with a little practice. As we do so, our skills eventually plateau where improvements become incrementally smaller for the time invested. In trying to maintain the continuous effort, boredom and fatigue can set in. Feelings of euphoria and invincibility when out in the black 20,000 light years from the corner of no and where tend to strike when seeing progress towards a goal or major milestone. Making it to a boundary, a specific area, or through a particularly sparse and challenging region of space gives us a sense of accomplishment. It can be that top-of-the-world moment which makes us think, nobody's gonna catch me now. Unfortunately, the moment is usually transitory, lasting as long as it takes to realise that the journey is only partially complete. 
There's still that next waypoint, the follow-on goal and the return trip to consider. Greed, on the other hand, keeps us doing things when perhaps we no longer should. A visit to the neutron fields, for instance, is a relatively easy way to generate credits. Jumping from one dead star to another and failing to notice the fuel load, though, might be the one little mistake that rapidly becomes a big one. There are tales of past explorers who, on entering the fields, got fatally distracted by the potential earnings, lost their way or jumped into places they could not return from. While the boost a good neutron scoop gives is pretty motivating, the lack of control while surfing the stream has been known to panic those with less experience. Everyone should be aware that dropping into normal space while in the stream will turn a slightly scary day into a really bad one very quickly. The distraction that a few extra credits provides might be the determining factor between arriving at a service station with 30% hull and not arriving at all. The perception of hopelessness hits when all of the options have been exhausted, apparently leaving only one final decision between extremes. Usually, this appears as a binary choice – press on or use the remlock. Only a choice insofar as the former appears unendurable, while the latter seems quicker, easier and less emotionally challenging. Moving on requires work. The remlock, on the other hand, means not having to worry about all that other stuff anymore. Even so, help can come from unexpected quarters. Commander Macedonica's now famous farewell post End of the Road on the Pilots' Federation forum motivated Commander Chigi von Richthofen not only to propose a solution, but also to implement it in person, in a spectacular rescue mission that captured the attention of the galaxy and even moved the Pilots' Federation to deploy a tourist beacon at the scene of the rescue. Let's face it, accidents happen. Whether by complacency, distraction or equipment failure, unexpected problems will occur on any long journey. Most of the time, these are insignificant – some minor hull damage or a hit to a module, for example. Since AFMU ammo and repair limpets can be synthesised, having the appropriate modules on board can ease one's mind. It only really becomes a problem as we keep racking up light years and mistakes. No one knows who the first interstellar explorer was that suddenly decided, I'll just freshen up this cocktail, after initiating a jump sequence, only to come back to the pilot's chair and find their ship overheating in the target star's corona. It is guaranteed that it's happened to a great many more since then, though. Competent pilots have checklists and follow them religiously. Greed, boredom and euphoria can all contribute their share of harm by helping us to take unnecessary chances in an effort to get the tag or even just to get the blood pumping. Various versions of the story about shooting the gap, say between that Type O and the close orbiting neutron star companion, nearly all end with significant damage to the ship and the pilot's ego. At least the ones we hear about, that is. Add the optional high-G planetary landing and a max-range fumes jump or three and the risks increase exponentially. Even Titans must rest. Fatigue is that fateful modifier that promotes falling asleep at the controls, making those unusual decisions or letting distractions override common sense. Thoughts of, I'm never going to make it back, when looking at 3% hull and another 32,000 light years to the nearest station, make for a very tough perspective. The task ahead seems daunting, even impossible, whilst the alternative sets us free from the pressures of trying. The old saying, sleep on it, can help. A fresh mind, looking at all the available options for a pilot stuck out in the unknown, might come to the conclusion that it's more epic to be remembered for trying to make it back than to be completely forgotten for giving up on such a challenge. While not everyone will be in such dire straits, they should all be able to appreciate this phase of the exploration process. 
After all, the time spent in the command chair brings with it an efficiency to our actions. Some urgency may still linger, but the limits once thought to exist have broadened with our experience. Returning home, we examine and contemplate our journey, a perspective stripped of tension, danger and adrenaline. Many begin by asking themselves, what have I done? What have I learned? And is that all there is? Or do I ever want to do that again? There are as many answers to these questions as there are people in the galaxy. It is in our nature to push the boundaries. It is fortunate that our equipment has some redundancy built in to accommodate our recklessness and forgive our distractions. It gives us all a chance to explore from as many different perspectives as possible. It's what makes living out in the black another of humanity's highest forms of art.